Okay, I think we're ready to start. Welcome everybody. Um, this is the Japan Society of Boston. It is such a pleasure to see so many faces here. How exciting to welcome you all. Um, an official good evening to all of us in the East Coast and a good afternoon to everybody in the other parts of the continent. And I know there's quite a few of you from Japan. So, ohayou gozaimasu to everyone in Japan and Asia. Uh, my name is Yuko Honda and I'm the executive director at the Japan Society of Boston. Um, today's program is especially exciting, not only because we will be talking about Godzilla or Gojira, as we say in Japanese, but because we get to do it with William Tsutsui and Alexander Zoltan, and we get to not only talk about this famed Japanese monster, but to see it in the context of U.S. and Japan and explore how it has changed or maybe not changed over the years. What's even more special about this program tonight is the makeup of you, our audience. Among us tonight are, I know I see names, I, I see high schoolers, college students, I see business professionals. So, um, I and thank you, Suzanne Basala, for sharing this event. And also, I'm sure a whole lot of people who love Godzilla, whether you've only seen one movie or have followed it over the whole span of the Godzilla um, uh, franchise. So actually chat is open. Let us know where you are joining us from so that uh, we can see where, where we're, we're located. Um, this program is the third of our Japan's pop culture speaker series. The first one was on Hayao Miyazaki and the second one was on the movie Shoplifters. If you missed those, and those were wonderful programs, head on over to our YouTube channel only after this event um, to see the recordings of those programs. Um, all right, so before I introduce our speakers of the night, we have the great honor of having Consul General Omori from the Consulate General of Japan in Boston um, share a few words with us. Consul General Omori. Uh, thank you for your kind introduction, Handa-san. Good evening, folks. It's a pure delight to me to join you tonight at this seminar. The fascinating title is Godzilla over the years. Needless to say, Godzilla may be the most famous figure in Japanese pop culture known in the United States. Maybe only Pokemon comes next. Godzilla is portrayed as a monster created and empowered by a nuclear disaster. The first Godzilla film was released as early as 1954. The first Godzilla film was simply titled Godzilla. The next one, made in next year, was titled The Vengeance of Godzilla. In the third movie, Godzilla fought with King Kong. Can you believe that? Anyhow, as many as 35 sequels have been created including animated films and movies produced by Hollywood. The latest live action Godzilla, named Sin Godzilla, was released in 2016. That is, 60 years have elapsed since his debut. Over the years, there have been dramatic technical improvements in special effects, and above all, it is also intriguing to see that each film reflected social issues that people of the time had a strong interest in. Maybe today's panelists will delve into that. Anyhow, I should not to, uh, talk too long. I'm very looking forward to listening to Bill Tsui and Alex Zartan speak with you. I hope we will enjoy the seminar. Thank you. So as you all know, tonight's speakers are William Tsutsui, who is endlessly curious about Godzilla, and Alexander Zoltan, who is endlessly curious about Japanese films. Bill Tsui is president and CEO of Ottawa University, an award-winning scholar and teacher. He is an outspoken supporter of the public humanities, international education, and more inclusive and accessible colleges and universities. He researches, writes, and speaks widely on Japanese economics and environmental history, 
Japanese popular culture and Japanese American identity. Alexander Zoltan is professor of East Asian languages and civilizations and director of graduate studies of regional studies East Asia at Harvard University. His research interest centers on film and audio visual culture in East Asia. He is especially interested in the dynamics of intensified media ecologies and his recent work touches on topics such as the relationship of electricity and film or amateur film and media production. Between 2002 and 2010, Alex was the program director for Nippon Connection Film Festival, which is the largest festival for film from Japan. So without further ado, Bill-san, Alex-san. Well, thank you so much, uh, Yuko, for that uh, lovely introduction. What a joy it is to be here with everyone uh, this evening. Uh, and what a joy it is to look down the list uh, of participants, because I see former students, former teachers of mine, colleagues and friends. It's sort of like this is your life uh, playing out uh, on this webinar. So thank you all for uh, joining in. Uh, I, it is a, a real joy to be talking about uh, one of my favorite subjects, uh, of course. Uh, and I want to give my thanks to Consul General Omori uh, for the warm welcome, to the Japan Society of Boston for sponsoring this event, uh, and to Yuko Honda for inviting me uh, to be here uh, and for that uh, introduction as well. I am particularly thrilled and honored, though, to be able to discuss Godzilla with my friend, colleague, and eminent film and media scholar, Alex Zoltan. Uh, I look forward to learning a lot from Alex and the audience gathered uh, uh, today. Uh, and I think this should be fun and informative, as most conversations about Godzilla are. Now, once you pull my string and get me started talking about Godzilla, uh, I can run on quite a long time but I've promised to keep my comments to 15 short minutes. So I thought what I would do is to begin with a quick overview of the Godzilla franchise, since I expect that this audience is a mix of folks, from those with minimal exposure to and knowledge of Godzilla to some extremely devoted fans, who, would I, who I expect know a great deal more about the series than I do. Then I wanna talk a little bit about how Godzilla and the films have changed over time, both in Japan and in the franchise's transition across the Pacific to Hollywood. And finally, I'll leave you with a question that hopefully we can all chew on together in the discussion and Q&A. So if you are not a dedicated Godzilla fan, mention of the King of the Monsters is likely to bring one of three popular perceptions of the franchise to mind. First, you may think of Godzilla's original incarnation back in the 1954 original film and think of the monster as a cinematic manifestation of nuclear fear, a somber pop culture meditation on Japan's traumas of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, defeat and Cold War anxiety. Alternately, especially if you're my age, you may recall the Godzilla of the 60s and 70s and the colorful, lighthearted, goofy movies made for kids with a famous man in a rubber suit wrestling with yet another man in a rubber suit, likely a giant moth or lobster or robot. Or, especially if you're of a younger generation, you may think of the slick, big budget, heavily marketed, and only tangentially Japanese monster presented by Hollywood the heavy set creature unleashed on the world by legendary pictures in a blockbuster trilogy between 2014 and 2021. Now, all of these perceptions are completely correct, of course, since Godzilla has adapted, morphed, and transformed over the decades, suggesting the big guy may be less dinosaur and more chameleon. Considering that Godzilla is now almost 70 years old, with 33 live action movies under his belt, 29 of them made in Japan by the major studio Toho and four in Hollywood, in addition to three feature length anime and a recent animated series on Netflix, it is hardly surprising that the monster has changed over time, reflecting audience preferences, 
market dynamics, political trends, and cultural shifts. You don't get to be arguably the world's oldest and longest film franchise or become a veritable global pop culture icon lionized on The Simpsons, enshrined in countless memes and New Yorker cartoons, and integrated into the English language through the Zilla suffix, unless you can roll with the punches in a fickle global marketplace for mass entertainment. So going back to 1954, the original movie in the series, the dark, brooding, and absolutely classic Gojira, was very much a product of its times, made less than a decade after the atomic bombings and Japan's surrender in World War II, at a moment when the post-war economy was just beginning to recover and the world was gripped by Cold War nuclear anxieties. Gojira introduced the basic narrative of a dinosaur rendered monstrous and radioactive by American H-bomb testing in the South Pacific that proceeds to attack Tokyo. The movie was a hit in Japan and was subsequently heavily edited, some would say censored or even whitewashed with most of its anti-nuclear political message removed for distribution in the United States in 1956 as Godzilla, King of the Monsters. The vengeful, politically charged Godzilla of the 1950s did not last long, however. As the Japanese economy picked up steam and the nation swelled with post-war confidence and optimism, as exemplified by the triumphant spectacle of the 1964 Olympics, audiences were not interested in gloomy musings on the consequences of nuclear testing or scenes of their booming capital city engulfed in flames. At the same time, with the advent of television, Japanese studios struggled to attract adult moviegoers and children became the most dependable audience in Japanese theaters. The Godzilla franchise was quick to pivot. Although the movies continue to deal with a number of timely social and political issues, from rampant commercialism and political corruption to Japanese remilitarization and the pollution crisis, to believe it or not, school bullying, Godzilla became a comic cheerful monster. Godzilla was recast from a villain to a hero, depend, defending Japan against legions of giant threatening creatures. The tone of the films became lighter and more upbeat and the monster's appearance was softened and rendered more cute than frightening. Godzilla was of course originally inspired by giant monsters from the United States, notably the pioneering 1933 King Kong and the 1953 blockbuster, The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms. It was only in the 1990s though that Godzilla finally made his way to Hollywood. The 1998 TriStar production, marketed under the classy slogan, Size Does Matter, has been panned by most Godzilla fans, myself included, and perhaps not surprisingly, <clears throat> for a movie featuring an escapee from Jurassic Park and Ferris Bueller, was not a particularly thoughtful or politically engaged entry in the series. That brings us finally, though, to the latest Hollywood offerings, the suite of Godzilla films in the MonsterVerse franchise from Legendary Pictures. The first of the Legendary offerings, Godzilla in 2014, was successful commercially and critically, channeling, in my opinion, the best of the Japanese Godzilla series and the best of early 21st century Hollywood movie making. It had a message, it had a heroic Godzilla, and it spoke to timely issues. Specifically, it addressed the human ordeals of natural disasters like the San Francisco earthquake, Katrina, and the 2011 quake, tsunami, and nuclear accident in Japan. The film did not use a man in a rubber suit to play Godzilla, which I really regret, but it did have great special effects and the kind of pacing and drama that Hollywood does so well in action pictures. Legendary's second movie, Godzilla King of the Monsters from 2019, 
was less successful in many respects, notably in its ham-fisted and harebrained attempts to address the threat of climate change, long an issue which I felt Godzilla needed to tangle with. Legendary's third try, the long anticipated Godzilla versus Kong, was hardly great cinema, but was, I think, a great pandemic picture. While the storyline and the human action were pretty much extraneous, the cathartic joy of seeing a big ape whomping on a big lizard, and both of them then whomping on a big robot, was just what movie audiences needed in the midst of quarantines and lockdowns. So how did the King of the Monsters change in his transition across the Pacific to Hollywood? Now we could talk about this for the rest of the day, but just briefly, the man in the rubber suit is alas, no more. Replaced by slick CGI and legendary, and also in his most recent outing from Toho in Japan, the magnificent 2016 Shin Godzilla, which I hope we'll talk about more later. Godzilla was also supersized in his latest American incarnation, growing to unprecedented height as well as belt popping girth. Finally, and perhaps most significantly, one aspect of the American Godzilla features that has struck and annoyed me is the way in which they all rewrite the origins of Godzilla. Deviating from the story established in the Toho franchise to deflect the blame for creating the monster away from the Cold War and above all, away from US nuclear testing in the South Pacific. So remember, the original story was Godzilla is this dinosaur that has managed to survive from the Jurassic period, swimming around uh, in the uh, waters of the South Pacific. America comes uh, to do H-bomb testing on Bikini Atoll. Blam, Godzilla is rendered radioactive, monstrous, attacks Japan, the rest is history. Fast forward then to 1998, the first Hollywood picture, the TriStar film. Well, if you're not going to pin Godzilla on American H-bomb testing, who are you gonna blame? Well, happily, there are always the French. Uh, and so in that movie, Godzilla's origins were traced to French nuclear testing in Polynesia, hence the annoying Jean Reno character running around uh, through the entire film. Fast forward yet again to 2014 and the legendary series. And this is really interesting because they really completely rewrote the origin story of the Godzilla movies to remove uh, any American uh, 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 blame uh, for creating uh, the monster. So in the Godzilla retelling in the monster verse, the earth is a hollow orb and inside there are all these monsters. And in the 1950s, the monsters started popping out uh, of the center of the earth, sort of like popcorn uh, out of a jiffy pop. And they started popping out in the South Pacific. The world powers at the time didn't want to scare people by saying they're giant monsters we didn't know about coming out of the earth's crust. So they addressed this by attacking the monsters with nuclear weaponry and saying this was H-bomb testing. So in this retelling of the story, American nuclear testing in the South Pacific becomes almost humanitarian in its way that it is seeking to save the world uh, from monsters rather than the cause of the scourge that was Godzilla. This picture really says it all uh, from uh, the legendary films. So to wrap my comments up here, let me just pose that question for discussion that I promised you. Why do you think almost 70 years after the big radioactive Japanese lizard made his debut on the silver screen, why does the world still love Godzilla? And why is the monster seemingly more popular than ever before? Well, if you were to ask me, I would say that on the most basic level, Godzilla is just plain fun the exuberance, the cheesiness, the cathartic nature of destruction, all are just enjoyable to watch whether you're six years old or 60. 
Godzilla is the outrageous guy that breaks all the rules and gets away with it. The walking disaster who leaves a trail of destruction behind him and inspires not just fear and loathing, but also admiration, awe, and an odd tingle of delight. But Godzilla also has a serious side. And I think one reason why we continue responding so strongly to him is because he has functioned as a cinematic conscience for viewers in Japan and globally since World War II. Godzilla's very presence, the disruption he causes to the status quo, and the existential threat the monster poses to our lifestyles, our comforts, our assumptions, and our complacency keeps us asking questions we know we need to keep asking about issues like the environment, war, nuclear energy, arrogance, prosperity, technology, and now after the pandemic, biosecurity, globalization, and the appropriate reach of governments during moments of crisis. In the end though, I feel that what makes Godzilla so compelling for so many and so significant, not just for Japanese culture or American culture, but for global culture, goes somehow beyond the monster's longevity, ubiquity, topical relevance, and sentimental appeal. Godzilla distracts us and makes us laugh, as entertainment is meant to do. Godzilla challenges us to think and feel in ways that pop culture so seldom does. And the Godzilla films shine with a profound and genuine optimism that we all need more of at a uniquely complex, unsettled, and anxiety-ridden time. In the Godzilla series, movie after movie, human society endures. Tokyo gets miraculously rebuilt, and the King of the Monsters returns once again from the sea. This essential optimism, this faith in progress and in the resilience of human society was important in the 1950s when Godzilla helped Japan and the world recover from the nightmares of the atom bombs and remains powerful even today in the wake of more recent tragedies to hit Japan and threaten the entire world. On some level, Godzilla is just a man in a rubber suit, but I hope you'll all agree with me that when all is said and done, the King of the Monsters is truly so much more. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sui Sensei. Thank you so much. Alex, son, I'm 100% sure you have lots of questions you'd like to ask. Absolutely. So it's always such a joy to hear. <laughs> Professor Tsutsui speak about Godzilla. I mean, it's it's just um, so eloquently phrased and so full of, of positive energy about a force that at the beginning at least was understood as terribly destructive and 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 terrifying. Um, but somehow we we learn to love Godzilla as we listen to, to, to Professor Tsutsui speak. So um Th thanks for inviting me and letting me be part of this this uh, because it's it's yeah it's just always a joy to hear to hear that. Um, I was I just saw that in the chat um, several people were were posting um, where they first encountered Godzilla and I'd actually encourage everyone to post that because uh, I think we'd all love to know where where we uh, in our different parts <laughs> in our lives different places in the world first encountered. Um, Godzilla, I actually, though I mostly grew up in Germany, did spend some uh, years in my early childhood in Dallas, Texas, and that's where I encountered um, Godzilla first, maybe seven, eight years old, and um, on Saturday morning programming uh, on TV. So we, we also, as we just heard, Godzilla is an incredibly flexible creature. And that's part of the, the appeal and, and what makes uh, Godzilla so enduring uh, in popular culture worldwide um, and means uh, different things to different people. So uh, knowing that Professor Tsutsui is in, in a way a fellow Texan, I, I just wanted to hear about his first experience with Godzilla and what Godzilla meant to him. 
you know, uh, uh, it's so funny you should mention that. And I'm, I'm loving seeing all the uh, uh, things coming into the chat here, uh, because when I wrote my book, uh, Godzilla on my mind, which is quite old now, but I still recommend to folks uh, as a wonderful holiday gift for friends and family. Um, uh, uh, one of the things I did is I conducted a survey of Godzilla fans around the country and asked them to tell me the stories of their relationships with Godzilla. And I was amazed how many people remembered, in some cases to the day and the minute when they saw their first Godzilla movie, what the movie was and who they were watching it with. Um, one of the things you realize about many fan obsessions is their collective obsessions uh, and that uh, people really remember being with their family, being with their friends, uh, and that this uh, uh, enriches that experience for them. So uh, my personal experience with Godzilla, I was seven or eight years old. Uh, I was growing up in Bryan, Texas, so a small town uh, in central Texas, uh, where there were all of two Japanese American uh, families. Uh, and I remember lying on my stomach on the blue shag carpeting in my parents' bedroom, looking at our giant uh, TV set uh, on a Saturday afternoon, watching the Creature Double Feature on Channel 39 uh, from Houston. And Godzilla came on and it was uh, one of those scenes where he was walking through a Japanese city, uh, making uh, 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 a chemical factory explode, and I immediately fell in love. Uh, as a kid, my first reaction was, I want to be Godzilla, right? I want to be that monster. But I think the reason why Godzilla became so meaningful uh, to me is because he gave me uh, an understanding of my Japanese identity in a place where there was very little about Japan to hold on to or to be proud of. When I was a kid growing up at recess time, uh, if Japan came up, uh, the only things about Japan my friends knew about uh, were World War II and Pearl Harbor. Uh, and so uh, a discussion of Japan usually led to me getting kicked. Uh, so Godzilla was something positive about Japan that I could invest in uh, and share with my friends. Uh, and, uh, you know, I still remember being in middle school, at middle school, that shows something about me, playing Godzilla uh, with my best friend. He always loved being King Kong. I loved being Godzilla. We'd wrestle uh, 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 after school. Uh, and it's a great memory. Uh, one reason why people do love Godzilla uh, so much, and this is something I found in writing my book, is nostalgia is a big part uh, of that love. Uh, because the series has been around so long, uh, Godzilla is for many people a lifelong friend, uh, uh, been there at major stages uh, in their life progression. And that's very much how I feel. Uh, Godzilla has been with me a very uh, long time and it takes me back uh, to some places uh, that it's fun to visit. Or one of the differences you mentioned between the, the, the huge number of Japanese Godzilla films and the more recent legendary films and and of course the the uh, um, the one from the 1980s um, is uh, the question of computer graphics versus the man in the rubber suit now um, in, in many ways the Godzilla especially in the early post-war um, phase of Godzilla, uh, that the special effects themselves have a kind of a subtext, right? So um, if, if you look back at, at the Japanese film industry and when they started, when, when the Japanese film industry started to use these kinds of special effects that employed miniatures um, and uh, used kind of created miniatures to and then filmed them in specific ways to make them look huge, to make them look real, um, that those are special effects actually inspired by King Kong, which you also mentioned. Okay. Um, and they first pop up and are first really developed by a man called Tsubaraya Eiji, who later on becomes the man who, who does the special effects for Godzilla and, and is, is very definitive for Japanese monster culture on film and TV in, in general. But he starts developing these in wartime propaganda films. Uh, in anti-American films about the attack on Pearl Harbor and, and so on. Um, so we have a curious situation in which um, the special effects of King Kong, which were hugely impressive and influential in the Japanese film industry and for Tsubaraya personally, then are used, are developed in the context of Japan for the purpose of anti-American propaganda films during the war. And then after the war employed to uh, express 
um, some of the wartime trauma um, that the society is still dealing with at that time. So it's an incredibly complicated setup just in terms of the style of special effects. And then um, what I love is the way in which that that uh, 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 special effects style becomes something in which the Japanese really master and become the world leaders. Uh, uh, and in fact, almost becomes uh, a sort of this Japanese craft form uh, that they can do after the rest of the world has forgotten how to do it, uh, essentially. And now, unfortunately, I think the Japanese have forgotten how to do it uh, as well, that the uh, costs of doing this, uh, you know, have made it prohibitive uh, that uh, it is much easier now to do it uh, with uh, uh, digital uh, effects, which is a huge shame. Uh, because if you look at, you know, and I continue to believe that the Japanese pop culture form that has uh, been least appreciated by academics globally is Ultraman, uh, that that is a huge resource there that we all uh, could learn from. Uh, uh, it is a phenomenal archive uh, of the way uh, that this special effects form uh, could be uh, deployed. Yeah, th thank you for saying that, because I agree, and I think many fans in Japan also agree that they, they actually um, want uh, the, the, the man in the rubber suit and do not at all <laughs> understand that as deficient uh, opposed to the kind of uh, CGI effects of, of the legendary films. But I do wonder if you feel that there is, I mean, um, I don't know if the subtext of the special effects is legible to anyone at this point anymore. Um, but the feeling, the relationship to Godzilla uh, in the two different kinds of aesthetics does make a difference for the viewers. And I wondered if you could say a bit more about what you think, what kind of difference that is. Yeah, you know, I do think, you know, I, and this is something I believe very strongly, is that the suit nation form encourages a kind of identification with the monster, um, which uh, is not something that has been well developed in uh, uh, American monster cinema in general, uh, where the monster is really held at a distance as an other, uh, but that in the Japanese form, at least uh, uh, on some level, because you realize that there is a human being within a suit, uh, even if that is not foremost in your mind at every moment you're watching Godzilla walk across the screen, there is a kind of primal identification uh, with the creature that gives a different veil uh, to the films. And I would challenge anyone who watches the original 1954 Gojira not to feel sad at the end about the death of the monster, you know, because you realize at the end, I think that's part of the genius of that movie, uh, as a part of the genius of the Frankenstein story as well, frankly, that you, uh, even as you fear the monster, uh, you are sympathetic to the monster. And you realize at the end, the monster is a victim too, uh, and has died uh, unnecessarily. Uh, so, you know, I think on so many levels, uh, the technology uh, of Japanese special effects uh, is uh, a key element to the movie's success. Yeah, thank you. The, I mean, um, one thing I'm really interested in is, uh, and this is something we'll just have to see, is uh, the, the influence of, um, or the switch in the way that Godzilla is going to be presented in future Godzilla films in Japan as well. Because um, as some, some of you maybe know, someone was just posting in the chat about the upcoming Ultraman film. Uh -huh. um, and that is supposed to kick off uh, a kind of um, uh, a new, what they're calling a Shin Japan Heroes universe, uh, <laughs> in which Ultraman, uh, Godzilla, Kamen Rider, and Evangelion, Neon Genesis Evangelion, all are part of the same shared uh, story world. Um, and a number, a series of films, kind of akin to the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and in a way, what Legendary has been trying to do by creating us a, a world in which King Kong and, and Godzilla and a number of other monsters exist and can, can encounter each other periodically um, and so on. So in a way, this changes the game. Godzilla was so flexible over decades yeah. because each film could reinvent Godzilla. If we enter into a kind of phase in which there has to be a stable story world of sorts, um, where he becomes one of many characters that have to kind of interact depending on on the on the um, on the on the film. How is that going to change Godzilla? Will will Godzilla still be a 
able to adjust with the times in the same way that, that he could before. I mean, it's a very interesting question. I think all of us here know about the media mix of Japanese pop culture and the way, you know, these uh, icons have spread across different uh, forms of media and so forth. And while, of course, that's true in Japan, where uh, Godzilla was comic books and advertising and all that, it has not been the case so much globally until quite recently. So in many ways, Godzilla in the world beyond Japan has not been terribly commercialized until fairly recently. Uh, uh, and I think that's part of the success of Godzilla, frankly, uh, has been its uncommercial quality. Uh, so it has not had to bow down uh, to sort of larger uh, business uh, and marketing uh, interests. And so I'm going to be interested to see how it plays, uh, you know, in a new sort of Marvel Universe kind of way, which seems a bit like a creative straitjacket uh, to me uh, in a way for the series. And I'm prepared to be a crotchety old style Godzilla fan and say, not my cup of tea with this, because I'll be frank, I tried watching the new Netflix anime series of Godzilla. I've been interested to hear from people in the chat. I watched the first episode twice. I'm like, I don't understand any of this. You know, am I too old to watch this? Uh, or is this just not my Godzilla? So, you know, on the one hand, I would say, you know, as a, you know, fan of the series, uh, fans do nothing uh, so much as complain uh, about that's part of the joy uh, of fandom. Uh, but I think a real fan also recognizes that a series has to change and sometimes in ways that you don't recognize uh, and that you don't uh, approve of. Uh, and so even if the new sort of, you know, uh, marvelized uh, Godzilla of Japan uh, becomes uh, uh, where the franchise goes, uh, I hope we can still celebrate the fact uh, that this icon we've lived with so long uh, is uh, going forward in new ways. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, uh, I, I actually um, wanted to also talk about something that you mentioned in, in the talk and what, about which you said, I hope we'll talk about it later. So I, I do want to broach it. Shin Gojira, the most recent uh, film in Japan uh, in, the, in the Gojira franchise. And um, just talk a little, to talk a little bit about what it tells us about the current moment, um, or at least the moment of 2016. You know, Shin Godzilla is just a great film on so many levels, you know, uh, 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 as a Godzilla movie, but as social and political commentary uh, as well. And the review I wrote of it uh, at the time, I said they should have called it Godzilla versus the establishment, uh, because it really is taking on uh, 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 sort of the Japanese political culture as seen through the particular lens uh, of uh, 311, uh, the triple disasters uh, of uh, quake, uh, 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 tsunami, uh, and nuclear uh, meltdown. And, you can and the film really is about the need to get beyond the sort of gerontocracy uh, in Japanese uh, politics and for a new generation to rise up in Japan uh, with a new energy. And yet there's such a gravitational pull uh, towards the conservatism uh, of uh, the past. One of my favorite scenes uh, in the movie uh, is um, uh, when the monster is headed down towards Tokyo Station and they've set the trap uh, to uh, uh, kill it. Uh, and uh, they have set charges and all the skyscrapers and Maranucci uh, to go down and fall upon him. Once the buildings start falling upon him, it is all these Xerox machines and filing cabinets and faxes that are falling upon him. And so literally Godzilla is crushed by the weight of bureaucracy uh, at the end uh, of, that, uh, of that movie. One of the things that's really interesting is back in the 60s, when Hollywood started importing Godzilla movies for double features and uh, drive-in theaters um, and so forth, of course, those films are very heavily edited in the United States. And one of the distributors famously said, you know what the problem with all the Japanese uh, monster movies is? They have too darn many committee meetings. You know, you turn it on, the first thing they do, they don't show you the monster, they show you a committee and they're all like, how do we describe it? What's the monster's name? What protocol should we use? You know, boy, you know, Shin Godzilla really uh, uh, parodies that beautifully. Thanks, yeah, definitely. And anyone who hasn't seen it yet, I, I really recommend Shin Godzilla. It's, it's a, it's a fantastic film and in a way it kind of as we just heard recapitulates a lot of the history of Godzilla at the same time so um I think we're at, at a good time to open up to questions from from everyone here so that we can have a a conversation uh 
any questions you want to ask, especially, um, of course, Professor Tsutsui, um, type them up in the chat and uh, Yuko, I believe, will synthesize some of them and uh, supply us with, with some of those that come in. Yes, I've already gotten a few in my direct chat and one uh, for Tsutsui Sensei, um, one big, uh, actually, three questions that came in that's in the same topic of are Godzilla fans in Japan different or are they the same? Or what's unique about American Godzilla fans? And, and how do you feel about things such as the an, uh, annual G-Fest convention? Um, so if you could speak a little bit to that. Yeah, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a great, great question because one of the interesting things is, so I've been a outspoken fan of Godzilla for quite a long time. You know, uh, 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 even before I wrote the book, I would happily tell people that I loved uh, Godzilla. So I was over in Japan doing my doctoral research in the early uh, 1990s. Uh, and I expected to be surrounded by uh, Godzilla culture and other people like myself. And what I found was there are very few Godzilla fans in Japan uh, at that time. There were huge numbers of people who'd grown up with Ultraman and loved Ultraman, but very few who identified in the same way with Godzilla. And over the years, I found a great curiosity on the part of many Japanese that Godzilla has become such a huge icon of Japan globally because the monster is not such a huge icon within Japan. You know, we all go back to the you know famous 1980s poll by the New York Times that put Godzilla among the uh, three most famous Americans, uh, three most famous Japanese that Americans could identify. Uh, you know, and I think for a lot of Japanese that was horrifying. For me, it's a little bit embarrassing, right? That you know Americans would do that, and yet I think Godzilla has become much more of an icon outside of Japan than inside Japan. I think what is interesting, though, is, you know, we've seen the pattern in global fan cultures that the otaku model has spread globally, uh, that what perhaps was a Japanese way of understanding uh, media properties has now become a global way of understanding it. And, you know, while there are Godzilla otaku, to be sure, in Japan, I think they're more in the United States. Uh, and if you want to meet them, uh, go to G-Fest uh, uh, outside Chicago uh, every uh, July. Uh, that being said, uh, I think G-Fest is one uh, of the most thrilling experiences uh, that I've ever had because it is not just super hardcore fans, but there are plenty of nine-year-old kids who have whined until their father drives them halfway across the country to go to a Godzilla convention and just ooh and awe at monsters. And so it is really a lovely affirming scene, you know? And the one thing you can't help but stress is about Godzilla movies, these are great family pictures, right? You know, the violence is all very stylized. Uh, in general, there's no sex, there's no swearing, you know, people from different generations can come together uh, and enjoy them. And so there's something very affirming about a fan culture that can still get excited about a property where you're not, you know, a shooter. So, you know, I, I find that uh, uh, another optimistic uh, aspect of these films. Uh, we have a question for both of you and a little bit Godzilla, a little bit uh, Ultraman. It's um, the question is part of the reason in the in the person's opinion for Shin Godzilla's success is the fact that it returned to some of the franchise's original political roots, commenting on Japan US relations, you know, radiation, nuclear weapons, etc. Um, do you think of the upcoming combined universe with Ultraman? will also continue that theme? That's an excellent question. Um, I think we'll have to, we'll have to see. I mean, um, one thing that may point in that direction is that Ano Hideaki, who is the director of, of Shin Gojira, uh, is the one supervising um, this kind of mega project of this shared universe that actually um, connects uh, several <coughs> properties. So this is, Toei, Toho, right, to different film studios, Tsubaraya Productions, which was a TV production company, uh, and the company owned by Ano Hideaki, which is, you know, who, who is, is primarily uh, in the past, has a career in, in animation, right? So um, it, it's a complicated setup in that sense, and there, there, there are many different interests involved in this, and that can often make an enterprise very conservative 
right? That's often proposed as one of the reasons why Japanese film in general has become more apolitical and very safe is because of the production committee system in which there's not a single production company, but um, five, six, sometimes more companies banding together to pool money. Uh, and everyone wants their interests defended and so on. So we'll see. I think Ano Hideaki is an interesting director and he'll try to take it in an interesting direction. Um, but I don't know. Um, Bill, what do you, what, what's no, your- I, I couldn't agree more, Alex, you know, that uh, uh, um, I have the worry that the bigger something gets commercially, uh, the less edgy it becomes, you know? Uh, and uh, uh, I think as we all know, they're political uh, issues and they're political issues, you know? Uh, and that I think where uh, the original 1954 film and Shin Godzilla stepped out uh, from the rest is, they had more of an edge to them uh, than the other uh, films did. Even if you can say Godzilla versus Smog Monster did take on relevant environmental issues, but those were frankly of such uh, a broad discussion in society uh, that they were not terribly edgy uh, at the time. Uh, so I would not anticipate that the movies that are gonna come out are really going to stretch us uh, very much uh, in those uh, directions. That being said, uh, I do think they could be very engaging and topical. I think um, one of the things actually that the 1954 Godzilla film and uh, the Shin Godzilla have in common is they're both reacting in very concrete ways to recent very traumatic events yeah. right it was um the war in in total not just the atomic bombings for for 19 godzilla in 1954 and in 2016 for shin gojira it was clearly the triple disasters and the entire question that the, the role that the bureaucracy played in how in dealing with that um so uh the other question is what's going on in society and what are the films reacting to? And is it something that has a kind of acute urgency, sense of urgency in a way that needs to be something that needs to be digested? Um, I guess the pandemic is a, is a hot candidate for it, but how a, a Godzilla film would respond to the pandemic, I, well, I don't <laughs> know. we'll have to see. Actually, maybe a little bit related to that. There's a question that's saying, um, when Godzilla came to Hollywood, were the, is it doing cultural um, uh, justice given that Japanese film industry and the American Hollywood industry are different? Hmm. Hmm. You know, I, 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 I don't really know how to respond to that. Uh, exactly, you know, I do think we have to judge uh, the American films on their own basis rather than putting them within this larger uh, Toho franchise. And, and I certainly think the first American film held its own, uh, you know, uh, so I've told this story a lot and, you know, apologies to all those friends of mine who are out there who've heard it. Uh, a couple of years before that uh, 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 2014 film came out, I got a couple of mysterious emails uh, and they both started, you don't know who I am, but I've read your book. Uh, and I want you to know I'm working on a project and we hear your message uh, that the original Godzilla series uh, uh, has a lot to offer as opposed to the 1998 uh, uh, Hollywood Godzilla. And it turns out the two people who emailed me were the original story developer uh, for the 2014 movie and the original producer uh, for that. They were subsequently fired and ended up in a giant lawsuit with Legendary. But, you know, I do think that the people who made that film really tried to channel uh, uh, the spirit of the Japanese original. While infusing it with Hollywood style movie making, you know, uh, you know, silly things like carrying a nuclear weapon on a train over a, you know, trestle bridge and so forth, you know, which is not necessary for anyone, but, you know, it adds to that uh, uh, sense of a, you know, modern blockbuster picture. I think they did a good job. Actually, time flies when we're having fun. So I think this is going to be the last question. And, and so you sensei, I'm, I'm pretty sure you get this question all the time. And I think it's most appropriate to end with this question. Um, so Bill-san, what is your favorite or which is your favorite Godzilla movie? And also another question related to that, which work do you think is Tsuburaya's best work? 
Ah, well, you know, uh, uh, all fair questions. You know, uh, my favorite Godzilla movie depends on my mood uh, to a large extent because Godzilla covers so much turf. Uh, and also I feel to a certain extent it's like asking a parent, which child do you like best? You know, uh, I love them all in different ways. Uh, I will say the original, the 1954 Gojira uh, really is uh, a moving film to me and it is a rich film. I see something different in it every time I've seen it. And I believe now I've seen it between 80 and 100 times. Uh, so that's a lot of opportunity uh, to see uh, new things in there. Shin Godzilla is right up there though, uh, as a movie that rewards uh, attention uh, to detail. It is a well-made film. But you know, Godzilla versus the Smog Monster is absolutely hilarious. I mean, it is uh, a, um, uh, a tie-dyed masterpiece uh, 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 of um, uh, sort of cheesiness gone good, you know? Uh, it is uh, uh, schlocky and it makes no sense, but it is quite wonderful uh, uh, in uh, not just its message, uh, but in also the direction uh, it took the series. So uh, I think all those are worth watching, but any is worth watching. I know a lot of people who will tell me after I've had a hard day at the office, I come home and I put on one of the Godzilla films from the 60s or 70s, and I just let it wash over me. And that's the way uh, the movies really are. And if you ask me what the greatest special effects are, they're all great special effects. You know, all of uh, uh, Tsuburaya's uh, films uh, are just fabulous. And a few of them, the Godzilla costume is a looking a little bit tattier uh, than in others, but there's a kind of exuberance and joy about those films and the special effects that take place in them that I think is just so very appealing and so very needed uh, in our world uh, today. You know, there is something that is cathartic about watching two monsters wrestling with each other. Uh, and you realize they're two guys in rubber suits. Uh, and isn't it wonderful that someone made that movie for us to enjoy decades later? Wonderful. Thank you so much, Sui Sensei. Thank you so much, Sultan Sensei. I think I think I can represent everybody and say, wow, this was such a beautiful hour to spend with, with you two. And how lucky for us, how lucky for us to get um, a full hour with the two of you. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and also equally, and perhaps, um, excuse me, um, uh, Bilson and Alex, um, perhaps a bigger thank you to our audience. Um, thank you for coming. It's a Thursday night. You could be doing other things, but you chose to join us and join uh, and chose to be with us tonight online. So thank you, audience. And, and, and you really are the reason why um, we are here today. And I think, I think it's also, um, I think it's okay to say, Bill Sun and Alex, um, that you are such a great audience that I think Bill Sun and Alex also had an enormously fun time tonight. So thank you. Thank